woman had the experience uh, of cat sitting for her daughter, and wouldn't you know it, when she, the, she opened the front door to get the mail, the cat ran out and went up in a tree and wouldn't come down. So she called the fire department and said, my cat's stuck in the tree. Can someone come and get it down? And the fire department uh, dispatcher said, uh, ma'am, we don't do that anymore. <coughs> but you didn't know that. And uh, the woman then said, well, then what, what am I supposed to do? And, and the dispatcher said, when the cat gets hungry, the cat will climb down. Are you sure? The dispatcher said, you ever seen a cat skeleton in a tree? <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, the next morning, there was that cat outside the door wanting breakfast. Don't you wish it was as easy for hungry human beings to obtain food as it is for cats? Especially those human beings in undeveloped, underdeveloped countries ravaged by drought or where cruel dictators withhold food from the folks that are opposing their regimes. I want us to... to to spend some time thinking and focusing on human hunger. It's a terrible thing when you can't get enough food to feed yourself and your family. Pastor Bill Hybels, the senior pastor at the Little Bitty Church in Northbrook, Illinois, <laughs> decided he was going to do something quite brave. Uh, or, or he, he wrote a book, rather, called The Power of a Whisper, Hearing God, and then I love how the rest of the title is, having the guts to respond. And he, he told of watching a short documentary about a reporter from CNN who was studying the effects of hunger on poor folk. And during the, the film, uh, the reporter interviewed a man who had lived with pervasive hunger most of his life. After hearing the man's story, the reporter decided that he was going to do something rather brave. For 30 days, the reporter decided he would eat exactly what that malnourished man ate. No more. And he made an honest effort to do it. However, by day 21, he couldn't do it any longer. He was so dizzy, he nearly fainted. So lethargic, so lacking in energy, his mind almost shut down. His body began wasting away until finally he said, I'm done. I tried, but I'm done. Hunger of that kind does tragic things to the human body. Watch this short little video. Make headlines like famine does, but not having the proper nutrients can be just as deadly. You see, hunger isn't just a stomach thing. It affects every part of the body. And these effects can last for a lifetime. For instance, a healthy brain uses 20% of the body's energy, and that energy comes from, you guessed it, food. When a child is hungry, the brain is starved. The result? Malnourished kids fall behind in school because they can't concentrate. Then, there's the heart. A healthy heart pumps a steady supply of blood throughout the body. But the heart of a hungry child shrinks, literally. So it has to work extra hard to pump enough blood. Vital organs like the liver and kidneys filter out toxins and waste, while the immune system fends off diseases. But when a child is malnourished, dangerous toxins build up in the liver. The kidneys fail, and a weakened immune system crumbles in the face of killer diseases. Skin and bones are also affected by nutrition. Healthy skin is like armor, shielding the body from infection. And healthy bones get bigger and stronger as a child grows. But when a child is malnourished, their skin cracks, allowing infections to get in. Their bones stop growing, which is why hungry kids often end up being small for their age. So how can we help? 
We need to catch hunger before it starts by making sure kids aren't just getting enough food, but the right food, so that they have the best possible chance at a healthy, successful life. There's no proverb that says, he who has bread has many problems. He who lacks bread has only one problem. Our gospel lesson for this morning, of course, uh, was about the feeding of the 5,000. Actually, that story, it's kind of an unfortunate title because it probably needed to be relabeled into the feeding of the 10,000 or so. Since the original number, did you notice, did not include women and children. Any way you measure it, 5,000, 10,000, it was a huge crowd. And uh, 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 what just prior to this, a report had come to Jesus that John the Baptist, his cousin, had been murdered by King Herod. When Jesus heard about that, understandably, he needed some alone time. He needed to grieve. So did you catch? He got in a boat all by himself and went away. But when he beached the boat, the crowd was already there. But rather than tell them, I need to be alone, the scriptures tell us he had compassion on them. You imagine how exhausting that had to be for Jesus. Because here he was, I mean, emotionally he was fragile. He had to be fragile. And physically then, you know, healing all those folks, it wasn't like he would just wave his hand and everybody in the crowd would be healed. It was a one-on-one -on -one, uh, process. All those people. Sun starts going down and the disciples look at it. They look at all the folks and say, uh, Jesus, get getting late. You better send these folks away so they can go into the neighboring villages and, and make arrangements to buy some food. That was not an unreasonable suggestion. In fact, that was a pretty smart move on the disciples' part. But Jesus said, yeah, well, you don't need to send them away. You can give them something to eat. <laughs> They said, are you kidding? Or, are you kidding? We've got five loaves of bread and only two fish. Jesus said, bring it. And he had everybody sit down. So they all knew something was going to happen. And taking the five loaves and the the two fish, he looked up to heaven, uh, he gave thanks to God, and then he started breaking the loaves, and, and probably breaking the fish apart too. And then he gave the loaves and the fish back to the disciples, and the disciples started passing it out to the people. No doubt they were thinking, this ain't going to go very far. And miraculously, everybody there ate until they were satisfied. They didn't just get a taste. They were satisfied. And then the disciples were going around picking up the leftovers and they found that they gathered up 12 baskets full of leftover bread and fish. That's an amazing story. No matter how you try to explain it. But I think the most important thing Remember, it's right there at the beginning where it said, Jesus had compassion on them. That's why Jesus healed. That's why Jesus fed the hungry. Because he had compassion on the people who were in need. Who, who were in need. And ever since that time, Christ's followers 
have understood that if we're going to really follow Jesus and walk where and how he walked, we too must have compassion on those who are sick and those who are in need, however that need might manifest itself. And there are millions of people who go to bed hungry every night. Even in this prosperous land, one in every six Americans doesn't have enough to eat. That includes one in five children. Now you and I, we, we've heard this truth so often, we, we might not even take it very seriously. There's, a, uh, there's an ad for a candy bar you know, that talks about people getting hangry you know, when they're hungry and all of a sudden their, their mood changes. We laugh at it. And the message is, if that happens to you, just go and buy one of those candy bars, right? Uh, hi, Papa. Yeah, it's tragic if we don't take it seriously. <coughs> the last time I checked, I went, I went online and checked some stats with UNICEF, the United Nations International Children's Education Fund. Approximately 27,000 children die of starvation and hunger-related diseases, which we saw on the video, each day. Do the math. It's over 3 million children a year. In one of his books, Gordon MacDonald told about an experience he had in Ethiopia years ago. He said, one chilly morning, he was walking across a field in the Ethiopian countryside where several thousand people had come during the night. These were desperate people uh, hoping to find food at a, at a feeding center. And since they, they only had the clothes on their back, most of them had slept uh, what was left of the night on the ground, which, of course, had been virtually stripped of any vegetation. And as he made his way through the crowd, several dozen Children crowded around him, and, and those closest grabbed his hands, others put their arms around his legs and around his waist, and, and, and he commented to the doctor who accompanied him, these are some of the most affectionate children I've ever seen. The doctor said, it's not affection they're after. They want your body warmth. It's, they're freezing. And it's all the worse because they're hungry. Washer core is a, a condition that occurs when a, a person has been deprived of food for too long. And after a while, such a person, they, they lose all sense of hunger. Even when food is presented, they no longer try to eat. Their bodies convince them they're not hungry, even, even when they're starving to death. This kind of hunger persists in spite of the fact that, that we live in a bountiful world. The battle to feed the world's hungry, it's not a hopeless cause. God has given us the resources, and in some uh, places in the world, real progress is, is being made. I mean, anybody here growing up have a parent say something like, clean your plate, there are children starving in... Africa, India, China, okay, right? Well, today there's plenty of food to feed the world's hungry. Plenty of it. Agricultural science and practices has made remarkable strides. We don't have a food problem. We have a people problem. Food is poorly distributed throughout the world, which means some of us have far more than we need, while others have practically nothing to eat. In some parts of the world, governments use food as a weapon to subjugate their own people. Or they'll make sure their soldiers are fed while the population is starving. And of course, there are those areas in the world are ravaged by almost continuous drought. 
and we argue about why it happened, why droughts happen. Now, answers aren't always easy. Okay? There, there is a law of unintended consequences. And we certainly experienced that when, uh, when our family was overseas. Rice is a staple food in West Africa. Uh, folks there uh, may have eaten all kinds of fruit. They may have eaten bread. They may have drunk all kinds of things. But they will tell you if they have not had rice, they have not eaten. Rice is the staple food. Now, many years ago, the United States of America came up with what was called the Food for Peace Program. We had more rice than we needed. Our rice farmers in states like South Carolina, Louisiana, Arkansas, other places, they were, they were just you know, growing rice like crazy. So we thought, well, let's get that to the starving people in the world. Audible, right? So they'd send over 100 pound, or later they became 100 kilogram uh, bags of rice. They sent them to the government, like the government in Liberia. And they said, we want you to, to sell this. Don't give it away, but sell it, and, and that will stimulate the national economy. Well, when you've got a free staple food that you can sell, there's a real temptation to keep the price low. And that's exactly what happened because there were, before uh, there was a horribly bloody coup, there were what were known as the rice riots when the government of Liberia tried to raise the price of rice in order to pay off the money that they borrowed to help uh, to, to host a, an overly extravagant uh, multi-country summit that they that had been there. And so they, the government learned, oh, you know, if you, if you want the people to be happy, don't mess with the price of rice. So they kept the price of rice low. All the free rice is coming in. And Liberian farmers stopped growing rice. Because they couldn't make any money. And so, a country that had been feeding itself on the rice that it grew became import dependent on their principal staple. I read a book very recently called Toxic Charity by an author named Robert Lupton. And this book hits the church right between the eyes because it, it, it asserts that too much of our charity has become devastating to the people it has meant to help. Free food and clothing distribution encourages ever-growing handout lines, which diminish the dignity of the poor while increasing their dependency. Well-meaning folk go into urban neighborhoods, plant flowers, pick up trash, and end up battering the pride of residents who have the capacity and responsibility to improve their own environment. We go on mission trips to poverty-stricken domestic and foreign areas with, with hearts full of pity, suitcases bulging with stuff to give away. That one foreign church leader described only turned my people into beggars. We need to move, Lupton says, from toxic charity to transformational charity. Just a couple of years ago at our annual conference session, 
I was uh, listening to folks from Broadway United Methodist Church in Indianapolis talk about the shift that they had made. Now, Broadway United Methodist Church used to be the IT Church in Indianapolis. They had a preacher that was on the radio every Sunday. They had a big uh, worship congregation that gathered a couple of services every Sunday. That bishop would, or that that preacher was so well known he was elected a bishop. And folks were coming from all over Indianapolis to that church, and then the neighborhood around the church started changing. And the pastors that followed that pastor had been elected bishop, they just didn't quite measure up. Didn't get the ratings on the radio, and the church started declining. We heard that not just the pastors, but some of the lay folk in that church tell us that they finally decided they were going to stop their food pantry. They were going to stop doing a vacation Bible school. They were going to stop doing this and stop doing that, and they were going to start getting to know, really getting to know their neighbors, the people in the community around that church. And they weren't the up-and-coming strivers that that church had ministered to 30 years earlier. And as they started listening, then that allowed them to encourage the people in their community to utilize the gifts and the resources they already had to work with the church, through the church, to make a positive change in the community. And it is working well. Some of you may remember Bishop Reuben Joe coming out with a simple little book called Three Simple Rules. What Bishop Joe did uh, was he kind of modernized the language and refocused on what John Wesley's three rules, three simple rules for Christians were. Wesley was never, he's never was never complicated in his theology. First of all is, do no harm. Good rule, isn't it? Don't hurt. The second is do good. John Wesley said, do as much good as you can for as many people as you can, as often as you can. And Bishop Job said, let's just boil it down. Do good. Anybody here disagree with number one or number two? But we know it isn't always easy. In fact, in fact, it takes so much time and effort. There are so many frustrations, so there will be so many false starts that, that it can seem we're like Jacob wrestling with God. And say, just let me write a check. I don't have to deal with all of this. Still the problems are we face are hardly hopeless. What's needed is not it's not more food. It's, it's not more money. What's needed is the determination on the part of God's people, those who say they are followers of Jesus Christ, to conquer. To have at least a part of the compassion Jesus had when He saw that crowd. What's needed are Christians sitting comfortably in worship to get out into their mission field. 
you then get to know the hungry and the hurting people, to listen to them, to build trust with them and love them. Bringing peanut butter and jelly and breakfast foods, now this month pasta, to the Portage Food Pantry. Providing backpacks of food for school children whose parents cannot or will not feed them properly. <clears throat> Sending work teams to Redbird Mission in the hills of eastern Kentucky. Those are good and holy things. Don't stop doing that. But don't stop at doing that. So who are the people who are going to have that kind of compassion? Well, you know who they are, don't you? So what are you, what are you going to do about it? As Christians, you and I are accountable for the needs of our neighbors, whether they're our neighbors next door or they're, they're neighbors somewhere across an ocean. There's a story about Rabbi Joshua ben Le 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 Levi. He was a, a Talmudic scholar, lived in the land of Israel in the first part of the third century. And Rabbi Joshua once made a journey to Rome where he was astonished at all the magnificent buildings he saw. He was especially struck to see how the statues were cared for. Because he noticed they were covered with fine cloth to protect them from the summer heat and the winter cold. And as he was looking at these statues and statues in admiration, a beggar pulled at his sleeve, asked him for a crust of bread, and, and Rabbi Joshua said, Here are statues of stone covered with expensive clothes. And here is a man created in the image of God, covered with rags. A civilization that pays more attention to statues than to people shall surely perish. And of course, there are hungers in this world beside the physical hunger for bread, for food. Some of those hungers are right here in our own community. They include a hunger for justice, a hunger for love, a hunger for meaning. And many of you are already involved in meeting those needs. Of course, the greatest hunger people have even if they don't at first realize it, is for the bread of life, which is Christ. The Christian mission will not be completed until every child in this world has a full tummy, a safe and comfortable home in which to live, and knows deep in his or her heart that she or he is a child of God. That's an ambitious dream. But it's a dream that's worthy for us as followers of Jesus Christ. It's a dream that all of us in some way, whether small or large, should be working to make true. And if we're going to do that, then we need to remember the third of those three simple rules. I admit some of you that are OCD, were you concerned that I just stopped with the first two? The third one Stay in love with God. Because we, we can't do the first two. Do no harm, do good. Unless we do the third. Stay in love with God. Through prayer. Through Bible reading. Through worship. Through fellowship with other believers. And through the sacraments. We stay in love with God. And that gives us strength that we're going to need. It feeds us with the strength we're going to need in order to do something about it. 
There's a simple little worship chorus that's in our hymnal that I, I, I didn't want you to think about as we share in the Lord's Supper in just a couple moments. He goes, Eat this bread, drink this cup, come to me and never be hungry. Eat this bread, drink this cup, trust in me and you will not Sing it with me. Eat this bread, drink this cup, come to me and never be hungry. Eat this bread, drink this cup, trust in me and you will not Take, eat, 